Good morning. How are we doing? Happy New Year. Yeah, I'm so excited that you're here, that you have joined us on this first Sunday uh, in the year of our Lord, 2024. Um, if you're visiting with us, you are a special guest, and like Toby uh, said earlier, we are glad you're here, and we hope that you'll uh, let us know that, that you were here simply by completing that connection card or texting welcome uh, to that number. We promise not to stalk you. Uh, we just want to send you more information about our church and, and make a good, healthy connection uh, with you. And speaking of uh, New Year, we actually had a great end to last year. Curtis has already told you how we ended last year financially, but uh, Christmas Eve over the last several years, especially coming out of the pandemic, has um, uh, been an okay season for our church, but a couple of weeks ago, I, I asked you about a month ago, I asked you if you would invite uh, your friends and your neighbors to Christmas Eve because that's one of those low-hanging fruit opportunities. People uh, oftentimes will respond to an invitation, uh, and so I just want to say thank you because at Christmas Eve, we had over 460 people, uh, including kids at our Christmas Eve service, which is 100% growth over the last couple of years. And so thank you. Uh, thank you for being people who invite. We had lots of guests, lots of visitors. Hopefully some of you uh, are back uh, today and are join us as we kick off the series. And speaking of New Year, it is a good opportunity to kick off a, um, uh, a new series. And, oh man, I almost forgot to mention this. Hey, uh, like 83 people have joined me in the Bible reading plan. And so thank you for doing that, uh, starting your year off on the right foot. Um, not all of us will finish, and that's okay. Uh, just take a deep breath. The, the, the thing is, you made a commitment at the beginning of the year to be in God's Word, and that's the most important thing. And so at least 83 people have joined me on the Bible app. Some of you have told me, hey, I don't do the Bible app thing. That's not my thing. Technology's not my thing. But I'm following along at home and reading at home, and so good for you. Uh, it's good when God's people are in God's Word. Amen? Yeah, so beginning this new year, it's always a good time to start a new sermon series. And this morning, we're beginning uh, a new endeavor that's going to be the backbone and the foundation of our Sunday morning services between now and Easter Sunday. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you. There's your pretty faces. Uh, if you have your Bible uh, or your phone, if you want to tap or flip your way to Matthew chapter 5, the gospel of Matthew that's in your New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. Today we're going to begin a study on the Sermon on the Mount that uh, I've titled A Kingdom-Centered Life. A Kingdom-Centered Life. If you are familiar with the story of Jesus or the life of Jesus at all, then uh, you probably are aware that during his ministry, Jesus did a lot of things. He's known for doing a lot of incredible things, a lot of incredible miracles and, and healings of, of uh, you know, uh, restoring sight to the blind and uh, healing people who were uh, lame. I, I think lots of people uh, know Jesus, especially those who didn't grow up in church, know Jesus by lots of those miracles and things that he did. But one of the things that he also did is he taught a lot of stuff. And he taught a very specific group of people, his disciples, wherever he traveled. And one of those times of teaching and learning is found here in Matthew chapter 5 in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, just to give you a little bit of background on that, it encompasses three chapters. So it's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's the longest recorded sermon by Jesus that we have in the Bible. And, and this is an incredible sermon. In this sermon, Jesus covers lots of topics. Uh, many of these things you've likely heard before, again, whether you grew up in church or not. Let me just give you a quick summary list of where Jesus is headed and some of the things he talks about. He talks about being salt and light. In fact, that's going to be our sermon next week. He talks about being um, salt of the earth and lights to the world. He talks about anger and murder and lust and divorce and marriage and remarriage. He talks about um, the swearing of oaths. He talks about loving your enemies, giving to the needy. He talks about how to pray. He talks about how to fast. He talks about what does it mean to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He talks about uh, not worrying and not being anxious. And he talks about not judging people hypocritically. 
He says, um, as we get to chapter 7, he talks about asking and seeking and knocking. He says, you should do those things. Your heavenly Father wants to give you some stuff. You should ask and seek and knock. He tells a story, a parable about entering into a narrow gate. He talks about the fact that wise people build their house on the rock. I mean, there's so many incredible, important things that he teaches in the sermon. And then here's how he sums it up. And so we're just going to begin with the last two verses of this whole entire sermon. I don't think this will be on the screen, but he says this in Matthew chapter 7. It says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, and he finishes his sermon, it says, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. However, to really grasp what Jesus is going to say in this entire sermon, we need to have a basic understanding of his key phrase. And the key phrase is this, kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, because that is a phrase that it's a theme that's repeated throughout. So let's just take um, a look at that real quick. Um, by definition, uh, the word kingdom means a state or domain ruled by a king or a queen. In other words, it's a form of government in which there's a, a single person, uh, either a king or a queen, who rules as what we would call is sovereign. I mean, like the buck stops with that person. Every, everything comes under their rule, under their authority, and not only that, they're charged um, with, with the responsibility and the well-being of everybody that they oversee that's in their kingdom. And this idea of kingdom has a deep and significant meaning in the Bible. It initially begins, th this word, this phrase, with this, this kingdom of God that he uh, set up, that he established for Israel in the days of Moses. Uh, and then the people shout out and they say, you know, we want uh, a real king. Like all these other nations have kings that rule as sovereign. We want a king as well. And so the kingdom of David is finally established. There's a succession of kings and it works well until it doesn't. <laughs> and after hundreds of years of unfaithfulness to God, the kingdom of Israel falls apart, but God promises one day that his kingdom, the kingdom of God, will be restored by a future king, by the Messiah. You and I know him as Jesus. And when Jesus comes along and begins his teaching ministry, one thing he said over and over and over is the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming soon. And those closest to him, his disciples thought that, well, this meant that he was going to establish a form of government in which he would rule as sovereign. And they would later discover how wrong they were after his death and resurrection, right? That is not what he came to do the first time. But you and I, as Christians, as believers, we believe that Jesus will one day return again to establish his sovereign kingdom in which he will rule and reign here on earth. So here's the tension. While we wait on this future kingdom, we live in the here and now. While we wait on this future kingdom, we live in the here and the now, but we acknowledge that ultimately our citizenship lies in the kingdom that's to come. And so what do we, what do, we do with that? How do we live now? And so living a kingdom-centered life, it's what we've subtitled this series, living a kingdom-centered life means living a life that's centered around God's perspective and his principles. It's about viewing life through his lens and not our own. It's about keeping the coming kingdom in mind and living those principles that one day we'll have no, uh, no option but to live by when Jesus returns. It's about looking to the future, what that kingdom will be like, but living that way now. And ultimately, here's what I think we're going to discover in this series, that things work very differently in God's kingdom than how they do here on earth. In fact, sometimes it's the exact opposite of what we think or what we expect. And so with that said, let's take a look exactly what Jesus taught his followers or begins to teach his followers 
And I think you're going to see some of these paradoxes early on. This is Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there's that phrase. Got some speaking in tongues going on, too. Any interpreters in the room? Mom, dad? Okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there it is again. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word. So let's walk back through this passage. Look back at verse 1 with me. The Sermon on the Mount begins kind of with a little bit of setting here, right? It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. So they're on some kind of hill, some kind of mountainside. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So before we get to the words of Jesus, let's just pause and consider the circumstances, consider the setting. The first thing I want you to notice is that there's large groups of people that are following Jesus around, as this was often the case, especially early on in his ministry. But here, and this is super important, he specifically sits down to teach his disciples. So so let me try and shed some light uh, on this so we understand exactly who Jesus is talking to here. The Greek word for disciple literally means learner. It, It was used of someone who followed a rabbi around, and a rabbi was just a, a Jewish teacher uh, of the law, basically. And, and so it's not kind of really that much different in how people choose churches today, right? Oftentimes people will go to a church and they will visit and they will um, judge that church based on the pastor who's delivering the word. Is he saying something that uh, you know, is he preaching the gospel? Is he saying something that, uh, that I like? And, and if he is, if he's presenting God's word, then, then I like him. I'm going to choose this church based on him. Not everybody chooses a church that way, but lots of people do. And so it puts you in the position of choosing who you're going to learn from. And so back in this day, if you wanted to learn from a rabbi, a Jewish teacher, well, you would choose them. And you would follow them around. You, you would say, hey, I like this rabbi. I like what he's talking about. I like how he unpacks God's word. I like how he talks about the law. I really like what he has to say. I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow him around and learn from him. And so you would choose the rabbi. You would choose the teacher. And so Jesus has this group of people who, as he's been talking, as he's been moving from town to town, they like what he has to say, and so they're following him around. They've attached themselves to him for training. Uh, I think it's also important that you know this. This does not necessarily mean that they were believers or Christians. I think sometimes we think that that's the case, but it wasn't always the case, because as we continue to read the Gospels, here's what we find. We find that many of them leave him. He, He... He begins to say some really difficult things, and they're like, yeah, no thanks, I'm out. So so they were a disciple at one point, but but then he says some difficult things, and they're like, yeah, I think I'll just turn away. I'm going to stop following you. I'm going to go follow somebody else who, you know, has something to say that, you know, that I like. When we hear the word disciple, we often think of the 12, right? I mean, if we were honest, that's normally what comes 
to our mind right away is the 12 people that, by the way, Jesus did the opposite thing, and he went and sought out his disciples and said, hey, you drop your nets, you come follow me. And so often when we see this word, we're thinking about those 12, but if you read the narrative of Matthew's gospel, you'll realize that to this point, chronologically speaking, Jesus has not chosen the 12. So when we read the word disciple here in this context, we cannot assume it means the 12. It likely means a larger group than that. How many? I don't know. Was it 20? Was it 30? Was it dozens? Was it 100? Have no idea. The important thing to understand is that this teaching, this sermon's not directed to the general population. He sits down and it's directed to those who intentionally sought to learn from Jesus, his disciples. Then he begins to teach. And these next few verses of the Sermon on the Mount are referred to as the Beatitudes. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. There's eight of them. Some would say nine. Some would say ten. I think it's eight, uh, and we'll get to that. But each beatitude consists of two phrases. It consists of a condition and a result. A condition and a result. So that, that first one, we'll come back to this, but says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So that's their condition. The result is, um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You get it? So there's a condition, there's a result. This English word, uh, beatitude, comes from the Latin word beatus. That's what that word means. That's the word for blessed. So he's about to start each one of these phrases with that word blessed. So that's the Latin root, beatus. But the Greek word translated um, blessed is uh, makarios, which is an incredible word because it means a happy condition. It means like you're in a really good mood. And so the Beatitudes speak of those who are happy and blessed. It describes their condition. Um, and so let me tell you what blessed is not, because in this day and age, with, uh, we got some uh, brothers and sisters that you know, get into the uh, prosperity gospel, and some of our charismatic brothers and sisters, man, they like this, like, I'm, something good happened to me. I'm blessed and highly favored. Uh, blessed is not, I went to Walmart at 10 a.m. on a Saturday and found a parking spot on the front row. That is not blessed. Okay, blessed is not, you know, it was a beautiful day. Um, I decided to go out for a bike ride. Wendy and I, it was a beautiful afternoon yesterday. We went walking on the trail that goes throughout the city. I'm sure it has a name. I don't know what it is. I just call it the trail. And so Wendy and I are walking on the trail. So yesterday, man, Wendy and I are walking on the trail, and there's no one for like a mile this way. I um, can't really see that far, but you know, a few hundred yards this way, a few hundred yards that way. And then I come across a hundred dollar bill, and I go, I mean, I'm sure this belongs to me now. Like, that's not blessed, okay? Blessed is not, uh, I go through uh, the drive through at Chick-fil-A, and, uh, and I get a spicy chicken sandwich, by the way. All, all spiritually mature people get spicy chicken sandwiches. Thank you, spiritually mature. And, and I'm a pickles guy. Do we have pickles people in the room? Yeah, pickles. So blessed is not, I'm checking my Chick-fil-A sandwich before I put my Chick-fil-A sauce on it, and instead of two pickles, I got five, <laughs> and so I take a picture of it, post it on social media, hashtag blessed, right? <laughs> that is not blessed. That's lucky. What Jesus is talking about here is that blessed people are those who are to be envied, for the condition of their heart. These are people who've experienced the grace of God. They are happy and they are blessed, not because of what they've done, but because they understand what God's done for them. And then one last thing, because this is incredible. You need to know this. The voice the tense linguistically that Jesus is using here when he starts each one of these phrases with the word blessed, it's really more like congratulations, like high five. 
Like, this is awesome. High five. Congratulations. Right? So as Jesus is describing these characteristics of a citizen of God's kingdom here in the Beatitudes, he's like saying, congratulations, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you already possess these attributes. You don't have to wait for the kingdom come. You can live that way now. And so even though we live in the now and the not yet, your life can look like heaven on this side of heaven. So let's take a look. It's a long intro. I feel like I should wrap it up. Um, let's take a look at this incredible list of promises beginning in verse 3, okay? Let's dive in. Verse 3, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this first beatitude, um, this word poor here in the Greek, it's the word for beggar, but, but in context, he's like the poor in spirit. So he's not talking about someone who is, is, um, uh, doesn't have a lot of money, someone who ha- has no wealth or lacks material wealth. Um, he's talking about those who lack spiritual wealth. In other words, congratulations, high five uh, to those who are spiritually destitute. Congrats to those of you who are spiritually bankrupt. Happy are those who don't have any spiritual resources whatsoever, no deep insight to truth, no moral backbone uh, to keep them on the straight and narrow. Blessed are the spiritual washouts, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I mean, I think strategically, Jesus puts this one first because it just levels the playing field. <laughs> All right? I, I mean, Jesus says how fortunate it is to be a spiritual nobody because the spiritual nobody is the one who's convinced that there's nothing they can do to have a relationship with God, that, that there is nothing they have to offer. But this is a person who's totally dependent on God's grace and mercy. And so the poor in spirit are those who recognize that we need God because we are spiritually bankrupt on our own. Here's the second beatitude. In verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, this one's related to the first because those who mourn do so because they understand their spiritual bankruptcy. (laughs) And the word um, mourn here indicates this intense degree of sorrow over our sin, right? This is not a casual sorrow, but this is a deep um, grieving of the soul, a deep grieving that you've sinned. It is less like, eh, I shouldn't have done that, and more like, whoa, oh my goodness. God, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry that, that I've sinned. Like, it's this deep sense of sorrow. And, and, and let me add this. Since none of us are perfect, we're all sinners, and we all mess up, and we should feel this deep mourning that Jesus says here, I don't think that that is a state that he intends us to stay in. I think that's a, a loud, uh, that's an emotion that's allowed. It's supposed to be part of our path as sinners, but it is not our final destination. In essence, Jesus is saying, if you are deeply troubled by your sin, if you are deeply grieved, if you are disappointed in yourself to the point that when you sin, you feel crushed, then he's like, congratulations. You should probably feel that way. The comfort of God's kingdom belongs to you. Then look at verse 5. He continues, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, what does meek mean? Uh, So here's my simplified version. I I think everybody, uh, generally, probably everybody in this room, generally falls into one of two camps. You fall into the confident camp or you fall into the cautious camp. 
okay? I won't ask for a show of hands, but uh, confident people, uh, personally, I fall into the confident camp. And so confident people, we're pretty self-assured. Um, we uh, like to be in charge, even when we're not in charge. We uh, enjoy sometimes too much telling people what to do. Uh, we're optimistic. We like to rely on our own strength. We, we, we want to feel strong, and so we don't want to impose on others. We want to do everything ourselves. We rely on our own smarts, and do not get me wrong, those things will serve you well in this world. But it's the other category that Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the cautious people. These are people who are willing to submit and work and come under proper authority. That these are people who are willing to disregard their own rights and their own privileges. I've heard pastors say, uh, you've probably heard this phrase before, meek is not weak. Meek is not weak. Meek people are strong, yet humble, gentle, and patient. Confident people have a hard time learning to trust God in their everyday lives. Cautious people, they learn to look for strength beyond themselves. So, if you're more cautious than confident, then congratulations. You're just the kind of person that belongs in God's kingdom. Let's look at the fourth beatitude. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. A couple of things to point out here. First, this phrase, hunger and thirst, it's a pretty simple idea. It just means there's this profound longing. Like there's this intense passion, right? You go too long without eating, what, what happens? You become hangry. <laughs> so there's intense passion, a longing. In this context, it's like the spiritual longing. It's a longing that endures and is never completely satisfied this side of eternity. And, and so what are they longing for? Well, the word here is righteousness. The definition of this word in the Greek, or the word that comes from the Greek, the definition of this word means conformity to God's will and purpose, thought, and action. Conformity to God's will and purpose, thought, and action. It refers to doing the right thing, obeying God's law, doing things God's way, not our own. And so the righteousness that the blessed and the hunger that the, the blessed hunger and thirst for, you know what it really is? I think it can really be described as personal holiness. And extending that desire more broadly, it, it's desiring personal holiness, not just for yourself, but, but for everyone else around the world and all neighborhoods and all nations. And so Jesus is like, if you're the kind of person that prays that God will send revival in an effort to help society, to help you, to help people around the world clean up their lives, to, 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 to account for personal holiness, then he's like, congratulations, because that's going to be satisfied one day. The fifth beatitude is found in verse 7. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In other words, those who belong to the kingdom are people who unexpectedly forgive. That's what this word means. It's kind of just, it's unexpected forgiveness, right? This is different than justice, right? We're justice lovers. Justice is a punishment that someone deserves for what they did, right? Do the crime, do the time. That's what we like. We like that, not when it's applied to us, but when it's applied to others. And so it's forgiveness here that someone does not deserve it's forgiveness that people get when they don't earn it. And listen, God forgives your sins. Okay, this is important for you to know. God forgives your sins, not just because you said you were sorry. Um, not just because you've, uh, you're trying to make up for it. God forgives your sins because he is merciful. Period. And since God is merciful to us, he expects us then to be merciful and to show mercy and extend that to others. So Jesus says, congratulations are in order for those who demonstrate mercy. 
those who offer forgiveness to other people even though they don't deserve the forgiveness because that's just the kind of thing that Jesus himself would do. High five, congrats. The sixth beatitude found in verse 8. He says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Okay, let's remember our setting. Don't forget what's happening here. They're on the side of a hill. They're on the side of a mountain. Jesus has set them down. Um, And if you were among the disciples who were listening to Jesus there on that day, after he opens his mouth and he begins to teach them, you would probably find yourself thinking at this point, okay, Jesus, um, I get the spiritually bankrupt thing. You know, you said the poor in spirit, I I got it. Uh, Those who are deeply dismayed uh, over their sin, uh, I got that. Uh, Those who feel um, completely cautious, uh, okay, I get that one. Those who long for righteousness, so far so good. Right, most everybody's probably thinking, not a problem, that's me, I'm in the kingdom for sure. And then you get to that last one where it's about showing mercy And I think most of us, you know, if if you were there that day, uh, they were probably squirming a little bit. Mercy, oh man, okay, yeah, you're right. I probably, (laughs) I probably should do a better job um, being more merciful. Okay, I'm going to have to work on that. Uh, And then we arrive at the sixth beatitude, and it all comes to a screeching halt. The word pure here means those who are without any stain or spot. And so Jesus is saying that those who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven are absolutely innocent of doing anything wrong. In other words, congratulations to those of you who are innocent, who are morally pure, both inside and out. And if you're there that day, you're listening, and it's like, congratulations to someone, but not me. Because that doesn't describe me. I'm not inwardly and morally pure. But listen to me, there is a way. Because the Bible says that if you are in Christ, not only are your sins forgiven if you ask, but that you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so in other words, if you are in Christ, congratulations. You will see God. The seventh beatitude, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Quickly, uh, this is not, so so many people have taken this verse, Jesus' words here, and twisted it uh, to make it say something that it doesn't say, and so this is not not about being a pacifist. This is uh, not about being anti-war. It's rather about those who are actively trying to promote peace and harmony in the world. There's a big difference. (laughs) Um, Being a peacemaker is not a passive activity. Being a peacemaker sometimes requires confrontation. Uh, I mean, it it requires confrontation. Sometimes when we simply would like to um, say, you know what, I'm just going to turn the other cheek. I'm just going to kind of ignore what's going on over here, and I'm going to stay above the fray and stay away from the conflict, and I think this thing will be more peaceful. That is not being a peacemaker. Being a peacemaker sometimes means holding your ground, taking a stand, standing for those things that are right and true and holy. Making peace is a pursuit. It is action. It is not apathy. And so question for you and I this morning, are you a peace promoter? Is that what you do to your words and do your actions? Bring yourself into harmony with God? Do your words and actions bring harmony and peace to your relationships with other people? If so, Jesus says, congratulations, you are just like your Father in heaven. Unfortunately, however, your attempts to promote peace will not always be met in kind. Look at the final 
the attitude here in verse 10. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, if you've been a believer long enough, um, you know this to be true, that doing the right thing sometimes causes trouble, doesn't it? That's the message behind this attitude. It's like if you've ever been mistreated because you did the right thing, if that's ever happened to you, then you've experienced another one of the qualities and characteristics that describes life in God's kingdom. However strongly you try to promote harmony, you know this, again, especially those of you who maybe work in some secular environments, you work around a ton of non-Christians, you know that sometimes when you try to stand your ground, you take a stand, when you try to promote harmony, when you pray for revival, when you live your life uh, like in a personal holiness sort of way, you know that sometimes those outside the kingdom direct their hatred towards you, don't you? Sometimes they're abuse. Sometimes in extreme situations, violence. And so experiencing persecution for doing the right thing is just a normal part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, hey man, if you're lucky enough, if you're blessed enough, if you're fortunate enough, you'll be persecuted. Congrats. High five. And then these final two verses, again, I... I don't really think there be attitudes. I think they just expand and clarify on this last one. But he says this, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. So he's just continuing the theme and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, those who belong to the kingdom, again, are those who will be mistreated for Jesus' sake. He's like, if, if you're being insulted, if you're being persecuted, if your name's being drugged through the mud, if you're being slandered because of Jesus, congratulations. He says, you're in good company. Like, there's... That's what he means when he says the prophets. He's like, there's many who've gone before you who have endured these same experiences because they too were following God. They too were trying to do the right thing. They too were proclaiming a message of peace. And he's like, what awaits both you and them is the kingdom of God. It's a great reward. And so ultimately, in these beatitudes, Jesus is like, hey, congrats to the spiritually bankrupt to the deeply dismayed, to those who are completely cautious, those who pursue holiness, those who are merciful and unexpectedly forgive others, those who are absolutely innocent, those who promote harmony, and those who are persecuted and mistreated for doing the right thing, and those who are mistreated for my sake. He's like, congratulations. Those are the kinds of experiences that help us find the end of our own resources, that help us find the end of our own strength, that help us find the end of our own comfort. They, they help us to find comfort beyond ourselves. They drive us to Jesus because he's the only place that we can find true and lasting strength, comfort, and fulfillment this side of heaven. And this is just the beginning of what it means to live a kingdom-centered life. I can't think of a better way uh, to start this new series than by the partaking of communion. And at Fellowship Bible, we have a rhythm of participating and practicing communion on the first Sunday of the month. And so as our servers are moving now, they're beginning to prepare the elements and coming forward, I want to give you a moment for reflection. And so Mark's going to come up and play for us. 
And as he plays and as our servers are getting the elements ready, uh, would you, wherever you're seated, just bow your heads for just a moment and um, take this time to prepare uh, your hearts to receive communion. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So as we practice communion, we are remembering Jesus Christ, who suffered death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once and for all the perfect payment for the sins of the whole world. And so in light of that, um, we come now to the table in obedience to continue to practice this in perpetual memory of what Jesus has done for us until he comes again. And so at this time, I'm going to ask um, those of you who've stepped into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is your time, and this is for you to participate in if you have not, and you're here and you know that you haven't stepped into a personal relationship, then you can just let the elements pass. Nobody will stare at you. Nobody will judge you. Nobody will think anything different about you. And so I'm going to ask if the, you'd just be obedient to that and also ask our servers if they would begin to pass the elements at this time.
On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, um, for this is my blood, which is given to you for the remission of sins. When you drink, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the bread and the cup as they serve as a reminder to us of the great sacrifice that you gave, leaving the kingdom of heaven, coming to earth, taking on flesh. Lord, living a a kingdom-centered life here in our midst, Though you were without sin, Father, because of you, we know what it's like to be spiritually bankrupt, to be spiritually destitute, to all be sinners, because all of us fall short. We know what it's like to grieve deeply over our sin. Lord, you taught us to be meek and to be cautious and to be gentle. And you taught us to forgive others. You encouraged us by telling us that we were absolutely pure and innocent if we're in you. And to promote peace. But God, you said it wouldn't be easy, Jesus. You said if we did those things that we would be persecuted, that people might say things to us, do things to us. But when that happened, um, it would be counted to us. It would be a great reward. And so, Father, as we just begin this series to dive into all these incredible things that you say in the sermon, my prayer is that they just wouldn't be words but that they would conform us into your likeness. Oh God, would you please do that amongst us? And pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ah, we're off to a good start. Amen. Hey, next Sunday, I I hope you'll come back as we continue this series. We're going to talk about salt and light and what that means it's just three verses, uh, I think, uh, or so, but uh, there's a lot to talk about in those three verses. So I hope that uh, the start of this series will bring you back next week to talk about those things. And I pray that you have an incredible week. And so would you stand as we read our benediction together? These words will be on the screen. Uh, We'll read these out loud together. Father, help us to live this week to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. You're dismissed.